Slaves, obey your masters. Really right here in Scripture, slavery. Haven't we learned yet that slavery is wrong, that it's an abomination, that its effects continue to haunt us, vestiges of racism within our world? I know when we read here in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and Paul begins to speak of slavery, there is something that is in me that wants to just skip over these passages. Baptist pastors in previous times, especially in the South, used pulpits to bolster slavery before the Civil War. We were on the wrong side of this argument for way too many years. In fact, it wasn't even until 1995 that Southern Baptists finally apologized for our part of slavery and renounced it and the segregation that continued after the Civil War and on end to today. But even when we realize that we perhaps, through being Baptist in the South, participated in things that were on the wrong side and apologized for these, it does not wave a magic wand and make everything okay. There are many problems that were rooted in slavery, the injustice and the segregation that simply have not disappeared. Paul, when he wrote these words, did not understand everything. Paul was not perfect. Paul was doing out of his own culture, and then many in the years following have dealt out of their culture. And we simply got it wrong. But Jesus is perfect. And Jesus got it right. Jesus did not speak on all of the social issues of his day or the ones that we face today, but he gave us clear instruction when he spoke to his disciples and said, A new command I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, so you too must love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for the other. Jesus says we cannot love others and mistreat them. So not only is slavery wrong, but also violence is wrong. Any misuse of power is simply wrong. Now before we are too harsh on Paul, let us also remember that Paul had much movement on issues like this in his own life. This is the same Paul who wrote to the Galatians and said, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. So if we look at these passages and we look at how they may have been misused and abused in history, we still cannot simply take them out of Holy Scripture and discard them. So we look at them afresh and anew in the light of Christ. And we ask ourselves, so what is Paul saying that would apply to us today? Paul is telling us not to support slavery, not to abuse others, but to be servants ourselves. Paul is reminding us that Christ served freely and therefore, we who follow Christ must be servants of Christ. We are all called to serve because Jesus was a servant. You remember Jesus on that last night of his life when he gathered his disciples together and they had that Lord's Supper. He also did something else. He took off his garments and he put on an apron, a towel, and he went to each disciple and he washed their feet it was the job of the servant. And the disciples objected. This said, you are the master. You are the teacher. We don't need you to wash our feet. And Jesus says, if you don't let me do this, you can't have any part of me. And then he kept teaching them. And he said this to them in John 13. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so. For what is it that I am now? Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. There are a lot of things that I wish Jesus had not done or said. There are hard things in Scripture. Jesus got in trouble a lot in his life. He, he talked to sinners and embraced them. He spoke to adulterers on the street. He talked to con artists, those tax collectors that were taking advantage of others, and he gave the love of God to them. Even upon the cross, he offered forgiveness to a murderer. That's just stuff that we wish Jesus hadn't have done. 
And yet, there are other things I wish he had not said that apply even to us today. Uh, that we should not love money, for if we love money, we will abuse others and it will get us into trouble if it becomes all there is in our lives. Jesus talked to those who were religious of his day, and it's applying to us today. And he said, if your religion is empty, you are like whitewashed tombs. Jesus looked into the hearts of those religious folks of his day, into our hearts today, and he said, be careful. Don't judge lest you be judged. And then one of the hardest things he'd said was, you have to forgive for if you're not willing to forgive and let go of those things that you hold against others, how can you expect God to forgive you? These are some tough things that Jesus said. And then he said, if you want to follow me, you have to be a servant. You can't be full of yourself. You have to look for ways to go out and to help others, those least among us, those who are most in need. Several years ago, I had the privilege of teaching a class called Young Leaders. It was for young pastors who were in their first pastorate, and they came, and we talked about leadership, and we would have several sessions with them and mentor them. One of these young men named Tom was in our class, and he was having trouble in his church. It was his first church, and he was out in a rural area, and it was made up of just two or three families, and they were tight-knit, and he was having trouble breaking in. And he said to me, Nelson, these folks won't follow anything I say. They don't want to do anything new. I just can't lead them. And I said, well, Tom, have you ever thought about listening to what they're doing already? Maybe they're doing some good things that you could help with. Maybe you should be a servant. He said, well, I've never really thought of that. I will look for an opportunity. Uh, he went away, and then he called me a few weeks later, and he said, Nelson, something exciting has happened. I said, what? He said, our church flooded. I said, well, that's not too great. He said, no, it, it, it's not that. The flood was terrible. The rains came down, and it just flooded the church, and the roof leaked, and the gutters backed up. He said, and the deacon chairman called me, and I went over to see what we needed to do. And I got there, and the whole church was already there. Men and women, youth, boys and girls, they were all there already. And I thought, well, I need to organize these people. And then I thought about what you said. See what they're doing. And so I stepped back, and I recognized that they were already organized. The women had out shop vacs, and they were sucking up the water out of the hallways. The youth had mops and buckets, and uh, they were mopping up and pouring the buckets out as best they could, and the men were down on their hands and knees, cutting up soaking, soggy carpet and handing it to children, and the children were carrying out these pieces of carpet and throwing them in the dumpster. And instead of trying to organize them, I went over to the deacon chairman, Tom said, and asked, where do you need me? And he said, why don't you help the children carry out the carpet? <laughs> Tom said he was a little bit offended at first. Of all that was going on, he was assigned to go do what the kids were doing. And he thought about Jesus' teaching that unless you're to become as a little child, you can't have any part of me. And so he did his best. He worked with those kids, and he carried out that carpet, and he was friendly to them and helped them pick it up and throw it in the dumpster. And at the end of the day, the deacon chairman came over and put his arm around Tom and said, Preacher, it was good to have you with us today. And he realized that he was finally a part of the church. And Tom said, he looked at his deacon chairman and said, we did good work today, didn't we? And the deacon chair said, yes, we did. And then Tom had an idea. He said, I wonder if anyone's houses got flooded today as well. And we have all these people here at church. You think there's anybody else in this community that needs help? And Tom said, that the deacon chairman looked at him and said, preacher, you finally had a good idea. We'll follow you. Let's find them and let's go and let's help. And they begin to go out and to serve in that community past that church. Just like the deacon chairman told Tom, you got to start at the bottom 
if you want to be a part of this. So too, Jesus looks at us and says, if you want to follow me, you start at the bottom. I think I've told you before about my next door neighbor across the street, Colonel Barry Seagraves. He had a horse farm, and I love to go out with, Doc, with uh, Colonel Seagraves and go out to his horse farm because I wanted to learn how to ride horses. And he said, Nelson, you know, you might get to ride a horse one day, but he said, what I really need you to do is work for me a little bit. <laughs> and I said, well, what does he want me to do, Colonel? He said, let's put you on the horse stalls. Have you cleaned out a horse stall before? Horses make a mess. And the stuff that you get a shovel and scrape out, it's not pleasant. But I cleaned out all the horse stalls that day. And I thought, all right, now he's going to let me ride the horses. He said, come back next Saturday and we'll have some more work for you to do. And he was cutting down trees. And I said, all right, I'd like to use that chainsaw. He said, no, son. He said, pick up the limbs and branches and go put them on the truck for me. And then he graduated me to helping pick up hay. It wasn't for two or three months before he finally said, all right, you can wash the horses. And if you do well with that and they like you, we might let you ride one. One of the best pictures I have is as a teenager riding one of Colonel Seagrave's horses. I, I wanted to impress him. I appreciate this man. I loved him, and he was a pilot, and later on he took me flying, and he turned the plane upside down, and it was so much fun, and I thought how much I wanted Colonel Seagraves to like me, and I was willing to do whatever it was that he might be pleased with me. You know, you don't have to do anything for Jesus to like you. Jesus already loves you, and there's nothing you can do that will really win Christ's favor for you. I mean, what is it that any of us could do that would impress Jesus? Think about that. Nothing, really. But we can, out of love and appreciation for what Christ has done for us, live lives like Christ would have us to live. And Jesus said, if you want to be a part of me, if you really want to show me that you get it, that you love me, do what I do. Serve others. Sacrifice as I sacrifice. For in serving others, we serve God. That is why Paul writes and says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Whatever your position in life, serve others as if you're serving God. Mother Teresa is credited with writing a poem entitled Anyway. You've probably heard it. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of being selfish, of having ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people will deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others might destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, others might be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good that you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have, and it will never be enough, but give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. We serve others not to please them, but because we serve God. Jesus said in Matthew 5, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is another one of those things that I kind of wish Jesus hadn't said because it sounds counter to what we're talking about in servanthood. Go and do good so that others might see our light shine. That's not the end of it. Go and do good so others might see the light of Christ in you. 
It's all about our motives. If we go out and do good so that we might get some praise, we've gotten our reward. But if you go out and do good because it is what God has called you to do, God will reward you. William Booth, who was founder of the Salvation Army, was once telling a story about one of his officers. It was after the Boer War. People were starving. The families got together in one little town, and there was hardly any food, and those who had a little bit were trying to talk about how they might divvy up what they had. And they decided that they would do it with the churches, that each church would take care of its own members. The Episcopal rector said, all who belong to the Episcopal church and are part of our communion, follow me. And they went off towards their church. And the Presbyterian pastor said, all of you Presbyterians, come with me. And then the Congregationalists and all the denominations, one by one, followed suit until there were just a handful of folks who were standing there. And an officer with Salvation Army rose and said, all you chaps who belong to nobody, come with me. For he looked out and he saw them and he knew that they too were God's children and that in serving others that he would be serving God. You see, Christ calls us to be servants, to use whatever power, whatever resources we have for good in this world. Again, Paul writes and says, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you whatever good they do, whether you are slave or free, whether you have nothing in this world or whether you have great riches, Paul says, whatever God has placed within you, use that to do good. There are some in our world that have very little power. And yet, Jesus does not let them off the hook. He says, whatever you have, take it and use it for good, and God can bless that. Some of you perhaps have heard the name Dorothy Day, not Doris Day, Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day lived in the 20th century. She lived through the Depression. She had very little, but she was a writer. She was a journalist, and she was known for writing some challenging things. She wrote this once, if Christians would take care of the poor as well as they take care of their Bibles, the world would be a much better place. She noticed how much they took care and cherished the Bibles, but how little they opened it and read what God would have them to do. Dorothy Day started a paper that she would write these editorials, especially for those workers who are being abused by those in power. And she cried out for justice. One day a woman showed up at her house and she had one of these papers talking about justice, talking about helping others, and she said, I'm homeless and I have nowhere to go. And Dorothy Day thought about what God would have her to do and invited this woman into her house and the woman brought others who came back. And soon she had a house full of homeless folks. And it became the first of 175 houses of hospitality that are still in existence today. She had very little. But what she had, she gave to God. And it multiplied. And others saw this great expression of love. And they followed this woman and great saint. There are some in this world who have a lot, who have great power. Jesus says, to whom much is given, much will be required. Maybe you know the name Max Dupree. Max Dupree was CEO of Herman Miller Office Furniture. He wrote a little book called Leadership Jazz. In it, he talks about Jesus as an example of the servant leader. And Max Dupree, who has a lot of the world's goods, has done a lot with that to help others. Max Dupree writes that one day he went to play tennis at his club with another one of his friends, another businessman. When they got there and they walked into the locker room, there were towels strewn all over. The teenagers that had been there before had just kind of thrown everything on the floor. And Max Dupree, the CEO, bent down and started picking up towels and putting them 
over into the baskets. His friend looked at them and said this, Do you pick up towels because you're the president of the company? Or are you the president of the company because you pick up towels? Max Priest says he thought about that many times over. See, it's not about how much you have, but what you do with what you have. Do we serve Christ because we are Christians? Or are we Christians because we serve? Jesus says, you can't just accept me as my Savior and not let me be your Lord and Master as well. Paul may not have understood all there was about how power can be misused in things like slavery. But he did understand clearly these words of Christ that when we willingly become servants of God, God can use us to do great things. God would like to use our church for great and wonderful things if only we will be Christ's servants.